All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of New Agreements. This might be episode nine uh, with my dear friend and colleague, Carl Gombrich. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dave. Nice to see you. <laughs> and if you guys have checked out some of the episodes, you'll know we've been doing systemic thinking. We've been talking about what's next for Extinction Rebellion, the history of money, a bunch of other interesting topics like what the heck is blockchain? I've been having a right old time of it, I've got to admit. Um, and today, we could go in a number of directions. Instead of trying to put a wrapper on it, I'll be able to give you the wrapper in the thumbnail by the time we're at the end of this conversation. What I can say about Carl before I let him talk about himself is that what he's done for me when I met him eight years ago or so as a young entrepreneur character, I guess, going in to do a talk at UCL. But what he did after a couple of conversations is Carl showed me that I liked learning. And it couldn't be a more basic thing in a way to, to say, but it also couldn't be more profound, really, the impact that that sort of gateway has had for me. I had done a few things and I had been given a few compliments, but that wasn't one of the attributes that anybody had really um, talked to me about before. So that's the context, really. I could say many other things, but I, I think that was the gateway that encouraged me when we first met. So anyway, Carl, thanks so much again for being here. And I'd love it if you could just give us a bit of a background, really, on, on uh, where you've come from and then what you're up to at the moment. Thanks, Dave. I'm really touched by that introduction. Um, as you know, we're good friends now, many years. And I always love talking to you. I don't know if you know, last time we spoke, it was about your recent projects and blockchain, corporate coin, history of money and so on. And I think we spoke for an hour and 40 minutes. Mm. I had the phone to my ear. I was walking around the garden, actually, yes. discussing what money is and how it works and so on. So, um, you know, I'm touched by that invitation because I certainly learned a lot from you. And mm. you have, in a way, a whole space to me because I come from this very academic family. Both my father and both my grandfathers are extremely eminent academics, all very Googleable on Wikipedia. <laughs> There's only one real family, Gombrich, sort of known, uh, you know, on the internet, really. We were very academic in some way, a bit closed. We didn't talk to many business people. Mm. We had artists in our circle, but not really politicians and really mm. very few business people. And you were one of the early people when I was at UCL building this course that um, kind of exploded that idea that learning is kind of a province of only educational institutions. And since talking to you and meeting now, since hundreds of other people, mm -hmm. I see the kind of energy of learning in the in the new entrepreneurial space, particularly, I think, all, all around the kind of the tech space, but also the kind of social entrepreneur space, mm -hmm. the kind of learning that goes on there. I, mean, I just love it. I find mm -hmm. it a brilliant um, balance and other pole to sort of academic learning. And one of my shticks, as you know, is to try and get these guys to talk to each other a bit mm -hmm. more so we learn from each other about these kind of urgent social, real world, commercial, commercial government problems that people like you and, and, and your circle are working on and, mm -hmm. and academics. And I want to try and break those boundaries. So I think it could be regenerative, you know, for both camps to, to do that. Mm. For, let me just say on that before you go and take us into your, your journey that gets you here then. The thing I noticed about you when we started talking was that for somebody who could say a lot about a lot of things, you were so curious, possibly one of the most, if not the most curious person I've ever met. And I just couldn't reconcile that. I didn't have a model for that, for somebody that could spend the whole time telling me things that one thought I should know or would enjoy to know, but I instead spent the whole time questioning me. And I think for any academics that wonder why they haven't got more connected relationships, let's say, I think there's something to be learned in that because that was that was one of the attractive things that then when you told me that oh I think you're someone that really likes learning I, I believed you knew me enough that and therefore it hit me do you know what I mean so that was the context for that basically but go on take us back and tell us from whence you came it's so it's interesting Dave as ever with your empathy and you know your ability to you know, to understand people you touched on quite a few things there which are quite relevant to me and my history. I think that character trait I inherited from my mother, who was mm. a, sort of a lifelong learner, really, and kind of a very childlike person, actually, had that kind of inquisitiveness all her life. She was youngest of five kids, but she was a person who always asked questions, sometimes too many questions, because mm. it can get a bit irritating sometimes, but she genuinely wanted to learn the whole time, and I, I, was very, I am very, very like her. Mm. Uh, although I've got this very eminent background, I'm not really a proper academic, honestly. 
Um, somebody called me a post academic, maybe five or six years ago. And I, I really like that. I have yeah. to admit, I, that's a, that's a, you know, I can identify with that and it's quite an original phrase as, as far as I'm aware. So I like it, but you know, I don't have, I don't have a PhD. That's the first thing to say, right? That's important in this day and age. Cause that's almost like a badge of being an academic. I did study an awful lot in my past. I have two master's degrees and undergrad and, and I did a lot of music. So perhaps I can talk about that later. But because I'm not a typical academic, I didn't do that thing which academics have to do in Korea, which is narrow down a lot mm. to do your PhD in effectively one extremely narrow area with mm. one very, very targeted question, and then spend anything between three, five, seven years mm. kind of researching that. And that's the reason I didn't do a PhD is my mind just can't work like that. I'm always wanting to connect things which are very far apart, which people kind of and didn't think about connecting what's weird for me but i hope gives hope to some younger people moving into this new era if you like is that when i was growing up in the 80s and 90s that was a really really bad problem because you know kind of what are you you need to specialize get a job for life or get your phd and i just couldn't do it i just wanted to learn new things all the time and it would be like you know six months on this and then maybe two weeks on that and then two years on that and so like what does it all add up to and amazingly, when I got into my early 40s, um, this kind of turn in education came along, which I think we'll talk about, about trying to get broader and what's called more interdisciplinary education and not stick to just single subjects for three years or, or more because the world was changing. We were just in a more complex environment which needed more connectivity and the internet was coming along at the same time. So these whole kind of memes or big ideas about connectivity, about creativity, combining ideas. That was all coming around at this time when I was in my early 40s. And suddenly all my weird wandering and questioning and being a, a lifelong learner, eternal student, we used to call it, became kind of the thing. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of getting on a bit. But suddenly people were like, how have you done it, Carl? And I was like, well, I connected my opera singing with my mathematics via my languages. And, and I was very interested in money for a long time. So I read lots of books on that. And, you know, and that kind of ability to make sense making, you know, that became a thing in the thousands. Now it's huge. Sense making, dot connecting, cultural sensitivities, different sorts of empathies with different people. These all started to be the things that people wanted to hear about. And I sort of been living it, but no idea I've been living it. Very lucky. The last 10, 12 years have been a, a joy that I never mm. saw coming. A couple of things that strike me, you've explained like the, the weight of the heritage you come from. Even in that context where it was all very, you know, intellectual, were members of your family not able to point out to you what it was you were experiencing and that sort of, I guess, generalism that was naturally occurring for you? Was that not like in the way that I feel like you created a bit of an intellectual home for me that I wasn't aware that I was lacking? Did that come out of your family life or did it not really uh, it's occur? A, it's, a fun, it's a fantastic question. Uh, but, but another thing you could be, Dave, is, is a psychotherapist. Seriously, you, you're good. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, in a way, I'd say the opposite, which is interesting, actually. I look at my relations and, and they're a bit different academics, all very eminent. But my father is, I don't feel ever see this video, but he's, he's a wonderful scholar, very rigorous. But I would, I would define him as pretty narrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, like anyone of great erudition, he's read a lot of books very widely and he's able to to access them. But really, he's a, a deep text expert on the origins of Buddhism. He reads the original texts in languages like Sanskrit, uh, wow. Pali, which are kind of like reading the Bible in ancient, mm -hmm. I think it's Aramaic and yeah. the Hebrew, early Hebrew languages. So he's very different uh, mm -hmm. to me in, in his mindset. My grandfather, his father, I would say is, is, is more interdisciplinary. He was mm -hmm. an art historian who wandered very successfully into fields like psychology, was a historian as much as an art historian. Mm -hmm. And he kind of drew, particularly that kind of psychology art history thing was unique to him. And mm -hmm. I've had many people say to me, psychologists, professional psychologists, how much he influenced their thinking. Mm -hmm. Although he had no qualifications in psychology, he was trained as a classical kind of humanist in, in the classics, in mm. history and art history. And I think these things do often do skip a generation. Mm. I think many, many of your listeners might think, oh yeah, I'm a bit more like my granddad or my grandma mm. than I am my mom. And so I'm a bit more like that, I think temperamentally, but I mean, he was a genius and I'm definitely not a genius. And uh, I also grew up in an age where he grew up in Vienna. So that side of my family is Jewish. Yeah, that's my mom's side aren't Jewish. So he grew up with a kind of what is called Bildung. It's a type of European education where they value kind of breadth and mm -hmm. uh, kind of a wider culture, much more than the British system, which you know goes to three A levels and then 
one degree. So I think I would have been happier in that culture and that education. But me being me and Britain being Britain in the 70s, 80s and 90s just wasn't on the map. Mm. No one was thinking like that. No one got it. No one had the language. No one had mm. the, the tools, the visualizations to think what that kind of meant as a whole. I hope that's something you know we're going to get onto today to mm. talk about how you think about this breadth and connectivity mm. as a whole. But I do remember my granddad said one really important thing to me when I was, I think, about 17. He came around to the house and he said, um, I was I was a bit lost, to be honest, like, like most adolescents. Mm. And I basically growing up, I either wanted to be a footballer or a, or a rock star. You know, who, who doesn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I came around and I was there in my 80s gear, probably had a bit of makeup on, you romantic. You know. <laughs> I'd love to see that. I've got a photo, I'll show oh, you one please. time. please. <laughs> And he said, um, he had a very strong Viennese accent. Um, he said, um, Carly, don't you want to put one brick in the wall of human knowledge? And I, <laughs> I said, uh, I, just, I just didn't know what he meant. And I, I just looked at him and I just too quickly, like, again, like when you're young, it can be a bit hasty, mm-hmm. kind of knee jerky. I just went, no. And then I felt weirdly and stupidly, I committed to that no. You know, like mm-hmm. sometimes when you make a knee jerk reaction, you say it. And then stupidly, again, I think, I did this anyway a lot more when I was younger. You hold on to it because you said it, you know, instead of just saying, actually, that was bollocks. Why did I say that? Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, he's a grand old man. I was very close to him. And having said that, I felt that I then had to justify that. Mm -hmm. And I do often think of that now. But, you know, I I now know what he meant, of course, a lot more. And there's a humility to that as well as a kind of purpose that, you know, as a great academic like my father or him, you believe in the kind of mission to add to the edifice of human knowledge, if you like. And that's what they had done. And I didn't do that. <laughs> At that mm-hmm. point mm-hmm. in my career from 17, I went, woo, woo, started quickly mm-hmm. all over the place until my early 40s, I'd say. Well, and indeed, and it's all kind of uh, coming together nicely now. So, By the way, do you want to tell your listeners that when I look off to the right, I'm actually looking off to the left and vice versa. So they, <laughs> I, have this, yeah. I have this theory that um, the camera being inverted means a lot of the tells we get from people are the opposite mm-hmm. of what they really are because... There's been a lot of research about if you move your eyes one way, you're telling the truth, and the other way, you're lying, and so on. So, and I do my move my eyes around a lot. So I'm a bit worried. I'm giving up all sorts of weird signals. But anyway, yes, what do you and, think? And, it is? and I think, and I think, with my non-psychological qualifications, that that might be the method that can tr- contributes to why we have such Zoom fatigue at the moment whilst we're in lockdown. So I think it makes sense until proven otherwise. So after all this wandering and all these things, I've mostly done either music or maths and physics in my life, and through music, I had studied languages. I've always been a big reader. I was passionate about literature when I was younger, so I read a lot of novels. Shall I, shall I give the whole life story and you could edit out bits that you, that you don't Yeah, like? that sounds good. And I'm definitely going <laughs> to chirp in when you start talking about opera. So, so I, I basically um, went to local school. I was very bright at school, but always a bit of, bit, bit of trouble, not super trouble. I wasn't brave enough to be super trouble, to, to, to be honest. I'd have probably liked to have been. So I wasn't in middle class druggie. We had a lot of those around. And I actually really... <laughs> I really dislike those guys. Mm. And then we had uh, working class kids. I went to local state school and there was Oxford Cowley Works there. So it was quite a town and gown divide, actually, my school, mm. which taught me a lot about comprehensive education, I think, and its challenges and to some extent how not to do it. I was a secondary modern school. So we basically came out of thinking about vocational uh, work, but we had a lot of kind of liberal kids of all the academics. So we had an extraordinary mix. Like looking back, actually, you don't think of these things when you're young. Mm. But I lived in a road which had like, three Nobel Prize winners on these two little wow. suburban streets, you know, and they, those kids, it wasn't my family, though my dad was very eminent, were going to this school along with, you know, totally you know, council workers and, 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 and factory line workers. And it, it wasn't very successful, to be honest. I mean, mm-hmm. I had one or two friends through football, particularly, but on the whole, it was quite separated. And I honestly, and I also don't think the teachers managed it great. Sometimes they had higher expectations of the middle class kids than the working class kids, which was a mistake. Mm-hmm two extremely bright working class kids who kind of failed by that system mm-hmm. anyway long story short I, I didn't enjoy school to be honest I was very bored I, I love making girls laugh and being a bit of a jester <laughs> I had a lot of detentions I dyed my hair red and blue and got suspended but I was very bright so I kind of kept up with on the coattails of things but it, it, I couldn't just do it by blagging it completely and in my lower six when we had A-level mocks in those days I borderline failed two of my A-levels. Weirdly, I got an A in English, and I was the only person to get an A in English in my year. But I did biology and physics as well, which kind of already shows you the breadth I wanted. I sort of wanted all the Mm. sciences and a lot of the humanities, and I couldn't. So I had to take two sciences which kind of didn't relate, missed out chemistry in the middle, 
And then I took English and I also would have liked to take music and geography, but you couldn't do that. I thought, wow, okay, I better get my act together. So I did study really hard up a six and I got decent A-levels, um, not spectacular, but easily good enough to go to decent uni. Not Oxbridge. I mean, there are only, there's only one person, my, maybe two people in my year who went to Oxbridge, which was really terrible because we have more parents at Oxbridge than kids and that shouldn't be, <laughs> school shouldn't be that way around. <laughs> <laughs> like value add was like minus 12 in modern <laughs> I wasn't you know, really gripped I was starting to get gripped by physics and philosophy which I went back to but I, I hadn't kind of got on the bus anywhere near ne enough to make the Oxbridge degrees in that I wouldn't wouldn't have been good enough honestly I decided to go and do music uh, I'd always dabbled in the piano not very seriously but got to I think about grade five in classical piano and I was a drummer. That was my other thing was, was playing the drums. I love rock music and then funk music. So I just thought, right, I'm going to try and get to music college. And it was a bit crazy. So this is something I've, I've noticed in my life. I leave things terribly, terribly late. And mm -hmm. it's not clever. But there's something about the thrill and the challenge, basically, and the buzz of trying to, that very early, very steep part of the learning curve, mm -hmm. which I just, it, you know, I just, I'm going to be, it's a competitive nature. I'm going to beat this. Everyone says it's not possible. Yeah, so I'm going to yeah. do it. Conversely, when I get to kind of here, I was like, yeah, this is, I know where this goes. And I don't want to do yeah. it anymore. So I'd like yeah. fall off and take up something else that's mental and completely impossible. So I sort of did, I did that with my A-levels. I was saying before, no work until I was like 17. And then, all right, I better do something. And same with the music. Really, classical piano is like ballet, you know, or, or football these days. You've got to be pretty good as a kid and a teenager. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. Mm. Um, but I thought, I'm going to get into music college. And I did. I, I went to Paris for a year. I had a wonderful year with my then girlfriend, very romantic, perfect happy year, I learned French, it was great. I was studying in piano in Paris, we were in a, like a one bed studio apartment. I built this single layer bunk bed, like one above and underneath had a little five octave piano and a little practice drum kit. And I used to spend about five hours a day under the bed practicing wow. on these two instruments. But I came back and to my, to my amazement, honestly, I got grade eight piano distinction. And then even more amazingly, really, I got into both the Guildhall and the Royal College of Music, which is like the two plum, apart from the Royal Academy, the two plum places. I think they took me because they sort of saw potential. I was very musical in the sense that I could tell a story in my music and it had yeah. a, it was interesting, but it was a little bit rough technically, if I'm honest. And, and they knew that. Mm. And they sort of very generously gave me a chance because they thought, well, this guy's interesting to listen to, even if he's not technically very polished. But... <laughs> the reality is the standard is so, so high in classical music, you have to have both. Mm -hmm. Absolute minimum essential is that you're technically perfect, and then you've got to have something to say. And I was never going to be technically anywhere near perfect. So I very early on, really, by the end of the first year, I thought, well, where's this guy? At best, I'll get a mediocre degree and have to get a piano teaching job. And then weirdly, my voice was discovered by the head of singing, Okay. So it was a, the head of, and I was, I was a guinea pig singing student. And this guy took me on and said, God, that's an interesting voice. Have you sung? I said, well, not really. I'm, I, can't, I said, I can't sing pop music because my voice is too low. And he said, yeah, but in opera, that's great. There's this thing called a bass. You can be an operatic bass. Of course, I'd heard of that, but I had no connection that that was what I could do. Jumping forward three, four years from A-levels, I kind of had my head turned by the singing thing because... It sounded exciting. I always loved performing. I was a sort of performer at school and either in, as a drummer or in plays and things. And it was music. I switched study at Guildhall, did two years as a singer. Um, but I really, I really struggle with, uh, with the world of singing. It, mm. it, it's very unintellectual, if I can put it like that. It's a real performer's role. So you've got to have strong performance skills, but also quite it's a certain type of physical robustness because you're always singing with a bit of a cold or a cough or hay fever. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. I'm a bit of a neurotic about that, a bit of a fuss pot. And I, you know, <laughs> I saw these quite strong, robust people doing this stuff. And also mm -hmm. I wanted to have conversations about kind of science and mm -hmm. that's not really the thing. You're, you're, it's not really what opera singing is about. So I didn't really fit in, to be honest. I got increasingly frustrated and I was really missing using my mind. So after a uh, a couple of years working, basically, I I jumped out and went to university when I was just turned 26. And I did maths and physics at King's College London and a master's degree in theoretical physics. Again, steep learning curve. I had to do maths A-level kind of evening classes uh, when I was working. Uh, but I, I love that period of my life. That was really one of the happiest periods of my life because mm. I went to uni to really learn. I was so 
thirsty to learn by then. And yes. I didn't mind being the old man, actually. It was really nice. I've got two close friends still from that period, although I was seven or eight years older than them. And they, they were there to do a bit more of the kind of, you know, growing up thing. But mm -hmm. they were amazing people, and we all loved each other's company. And I was really happy there. Uh, though I do, I do wish I'd been to university in the age of the internet with that same hunger. Yes. Because it slightly slowed me that I had to write yes. down all my questions every week on a piece of A4 paper, like you get in those pads, mm -hmm. and then wait to see the tutor for one hour in the office hour every yes. week. And my head was just... I Buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. And if I had the internet now, I'd just yes. be totally immersed in that. I'm sure I would have gone way further. Yes. Even though I, did, I did well, but I would have gone off the charts, I think. I would double down or triple down on that point. When you say slowed you down slightly, you know, in the world of startups, you talk about lean startups. You know, what is the minimum amount of resource you need to deploy to get your next learning moment in the business to then pivot, change it or whatever? And I think that that's the case with learning as well. You want a lean learning environment. What's the quickest way? And I think this might be something that we discuss in general. You know, when you look at the way I sort of find the things I want to find out, I've had the privilege that you didn't have of that internet at my fingertips when I was going through that same period at 26, 27, where I suddenly realized, partly with your help, that, oh, actually, I like learning and I'm quite good at it, plus the internet means that actually if you think about it a week-long cycle if you will of like question generation and then sort of answers or guidance that then lead to the next cycle one week cycle that can be one day for me it could be seven times faster basically than than you were experiencing which is not marginal do you know what i mean that's significant that's a great point it's not only the seven times faster it's the kind of motivational aspect of being able to answer your questions when you want to mm. so yeah I, I like i like the scaling you've done there's the kind of added doubling effect of just being so inspired by this kind of real-time mm. learning. Yeah, it's a different age and it's funny because I don't see that as much as I thought I would in, mm. in students mm. today. I, you know, for what I've ended up doing now, uh, I spend a lot of time telling people why they really bothering to go to university because if they're real <laughs> learners, they can do it all like you do. And people are like, hey, hold on, you're not selling your course. I'm like, mm. I've got to be honest about this. I, I don't get why a lot of people go to university. And, so it's interesting because I, I need to be sure that I'm offering something at university that I do mm -hmm. think is going to be worth going to the university for. Mm -hmm. Because I honestly think if you want to study a normal degree mm -hmm. in the stuff which you can get for free online, better mm -hmm. taught probably mm -hmm. from one of the great American colleges, why are you spending nine grand a year? You're really spending nine grand a year to understand, you know, how to get drunk and, and relate to the other, other yeah. gender. Just, I just don't get that kind of mm. psychologically or economically. But I think it's partly a function of schooling still. The schools just haven't really worked out on the whole exam system, certainly hasn't, mm. how to leverage the internet in learning. So kids mm. still think somehow that going to uni is going to be a kind of professor teaching them the book, yeah. and then they're going to get the exam in the book. And that's what learning is when you know perfectly well that's just not right anymore. No. And um, it's interesting having this conversation because now I'm looking back at my engagement with your course at UCL and the main students that we know well, you know, Virginia, Lena, Ollie, that we both stayed well connected with. We were all part in one way or another of founding that course. And but if I think about structurally, what did your degree there offer? It was a social network. You pulled people from different countries and different backgrounds because of, I guess, its prestige and uniqueness and difficulty, there's two sides to the coin. One is I got to meet this incredibly talented, incredibly bright, unique set of friends who then met each other. Don't just read what's on the textbooks. You're here to be with each other and hopefully played my little droplet in accelerating that on their, on their first day. And the social network effect of actually bringing them into a room together from all around Europe and then them then going back out to the world has been incredibly explosive on just a very basic social level, aside okay. from any of the combinatory effects that happen when they are in that room as well. Well, one thing you said to me, or I think I said it to you after a conversation, I tweeted out, but it's something we'd come to together as a, as a, mm. as a definition. Modern expertise mm. is knowing how to leverage your network. Mm. And that for me is so profound because it takes away the whole idea that expertise is tied to knowledge of a particular bound sort in a department, in a, in a, in a program, in a book. And I believe it. <laughs> you know, I mean, mm. it was also I was reading people like Harold, Harold Jarkey and other business thinkers who've done stuff on this. But we're mm. still in the process of ingesting what that really means. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about 
the learning you do at, at school, all the answers are actually on the web. So you're given a math mm. problem, you can literally type into Google now, copy down that, that answer. So what is the point in that knowledge? There's much more expertise in knowing where to get an answer, knowing what it's trying to tell you, checking with someone else whether it's a good answer. And this mm. isn't to take knowledge completely out of the equation. You never can do that, otherwise you mm. simply sort of don't know where to start or what you're looking at. But yeah. it does radically change the perception of, of what expertise is, if not for everybody, because mm. there will need to be some very narrow experts still, for a lot of people like you, like me, mm. like lots of mm. people we know. And so that was really important. I just want to go back about why we, why we were talking together. And that was, you know, we met, we had this great conversation and at UCL. We wanted to kind of understand the modern world of work, really. Mm. And we, we had you in the room. We had a senior entrepreneur who'd been a, a major broadcasting company. We had KPMG and so yeah. on. And we were just trying to make this connection, which is something I've gone on to try and do a lot more in the past eight, nine years between higher education, as it's called, and, and the real world of work. And you were there uh, and you were fantastic. You know, um, I know you probably didn't think of it, but you had a gravitas about your world e even then. You were there as an sort of entrepreneur, I guess, a young, young mm. entrepreneur. It was funny, actually, it being UCL, it was a fantastic place, UCL, but they do think they know everything. And sometimes mm -hmm. when, when, you know, we had this idea that what we were doing was really great for the modern world of work and no one sort of thought, well, should we actually ask some employers or people who work outside? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what this committee was. And you mm -hmm. came into that to represent, as I say, what, what you do. And, and it was really useful. You know, we learned mm -hmm. a lot about what graduate jobs are like, what recruitment looks like and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. It was ironic because I remember saying, look, to the KPMG guy, Look, I'm sitting here with you as a 24-year-old discussing, or whatever I was at the time, discussing all this. I wouldn't make it into your grad scheme because I don't have a degree. So you may not want me to work for KPMG, but even if you did want me to, you wouldn't have any way of getting hold of me because you filter me out at the first step. This has all been, you were right at the beginning of that period of change and EY did a kind of non-university stream and loads of people have done it since mm. which is interesting because i know it's going on and i think it's lively and successful but it hasn't actually cracked or impacted on the mm. higher education sector which, which is interesting it's maybe just you know adding more there's more mm. opportunities for people but the higher education sector as a whole the standard universities haven't changed very much in response to those initiatives i think and i don't know what you i mean we we are way off base here but we will come back in the end but i just can't miss the opportunity because it's so fun but i think there's room for actually a really rigorous way of verifying somebody's self-learning capabilities. You know, I want to know if somebody has shown evidence, if they've learned the ability to learn in a powerful and verifiable way. And if, if there was a way of qualifying that, I think that would be incredibly financially valuable to both the individual and potential organizations because, you know, bless that um, KPMG guy, how is he supposed to know if I'm just blagging, which I probably was, or whether I've actually got the goods to deliver when it comes to consulting work, you know? But if I could verify my sort of engine power, if, I, if it were, if it had been audited effectively, then that would be, I mean, that would have helped me a lot, to, to be honest with you. Do you think there is, uh, um, do you actually have some concrete ideas about that? Obviously, as you know, through the work that we ended up doing together, where I came and did those guest lectures about the nature of how intelligence flow works and how you might facilitate the growth and unblocking of that in a more theoretical way. But actually, in terms of like having a course, having a some kind of testing environment, I haven't thought about it, but I'm just thinking back now to who I was back then. And if I wasn't so lucky to have met and become friends with you and the rest of the gang, I would never have bolted into the more intellectual conversation, if you will. I would have gone bounced back into just doing things and not being aware that I was enjoying learning, maybe capable of learning to learn and doing an all right job at it. So I, I guess, no, I don't have any concrete ideas, but I, it would be something I'd like to think about more and what would demonstrate it well in a way that employers could care about. Um, That's re really interesting, really interesting, Dave. I'd really like to talk with you more about that because I have this thing about the kind of everyone has a life of the mind. Everyone is to some extent an intellectual when they find the right person to be interested in, mm. in that life of their mind. That sounds a little bit almost patronizing or, or kind of elitist, but it's, I don't mean it to be and I don't feel it to be. It's just like, giving someone an opportunity to express themselves in that intellectual way. I think it's actually a human kind of need and joy. You know, your journey, you're not, when you recount it back to me, mm -hmm. it makes me very happy to yeah. be part of that. And, but I wonder genuinely 
how many people there are like you out there who could start that connection what, what's your kind of feeling on that i think there's tons i think there are tons of people especially now people who have got used to the internet and even if they're doing it just casually for their interest in stocks and shares on the side or whether they're teaching themselves bitcoin or whatever it is their little pursuits on the side i i think a lot of people have learned some skills that they don't know the importance of and don't know how to credit how good they are the main problem for me at 24 is that I didn't know how much I was blagging and how much I actually had the ability to learn to learn. I didn't really know my own capabilities in that regard. Well, what was it that we gave you then? So for someone like me, not mm. brilliant academically at school, but kind of immersed in that culture of academia, that culture of critical inquiry, if you like, mm. what was it that you think I and, and UCL as, a, as an environment gave you that that made you able to see what you were doing and kind of then uh, then open a door to take it mm. to the next level i'd really like to understand what that was that happened to you and, and i think the gateway is exactly what you're exhibiting now which is that and anybody who's watching this will have just seen it and if not they can go back a minute and watch it which is kind of meta sort of analysis if you will but like your genuine curiosity that that is an act of respect that curiosity is an act of respect of my mind. And just being respected was partly what opened the, the, well, is what opened the door for me to care and to want to engage more because I felt respected ultimately. I wouldn't have called it that, but I feel validated in the very act of your curiosity. It's the most validating thing. Nothing really else you could say other than ask me a meaningful question about what I think would have done that. But then as it went on, it was a language set that helped make sense of how I was thinking naturally and had never found, i never met an offer from an institution that I felt, oh, I just naturally fit into that in a way that just gives me, you know, like a good poet does, you know, gives you words for feelings that you didn't know how to articulate. I always felt square ped circle hole. And I just thought that's the way it is because I didn't know any different. It wasn't kind of a book or literature. It was more, I like that word respect and you know it's something we can all learn for each other so that's a, an easy win for me it's really helpful that you say that mm. um but it was more that that dialogue and that respect for you as a thinker at whatever level you perceived yourself to be than mm. you know a bunch of knowledge or a bunch of text was it oh what 100 percent. like <laughs> you know i've read the knowledge power thing and i've you know i've read a bunch you know you've given me a whole list of things along the way that i've either read the first chapter or the first third or sometimes get through the whole thing none of that validates me none of that opened up a door for me or made me feel like a sense of home and obviously the characters that I then continued to meet I guess that there was integrity all the way through it was you the way you dealt with me the language you offered me the encouragement along the way and then the other characters I met like Amanda some of the gang that came along, the way they responded to the projects that I offered. There was a symbiosis. I had done the interesting and difficult work of putting myself in a scenario at the front edge of thinking about the way giving and technology works. And I had managed to get hold of a behavior economics paper in giving from Sarah Smith at Bristol. So that's what I had done. But all I knew what to do with that until then was look at it myself and try and think about it myself. I was lonely. Whereas by being able to say, Carl, do you reckon, I remember I was in Waterloo Station and I called you in Waterloo Station. I said, what do you reckon about a little project with your gang? And he said, all right, we'll put it out and see if anyone responds. But that I, met, I found friends to then validate the fact that I wasn't just a nutter, you know, if you will. Like, why have I got this paper and I don't know anything about anything? You know, now I had people to do it with. So if I was to summarize it, it would be your authentic curiosity bred a feeling of respect and then the culture that led to socially and language wise was one that I felt my energies were being received and multiplied so therefore fertile ground for me to spend my life or parts of my life rather than deaf ears and dead time and disrespect that's really beautiful uh, sorry <clears throat> Choking up over here. Oh. Uh, if you, Dave, I just, now you have, you've got to be an even bigger success than you are. So I can use that on my, <laughs> on my epitaph or my next CV or something that that's uh wow. That's a really, 
well, helpful is a cliche these days. That's a really moving summary. Um, oh, um, good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it is because I didn't intend it to be. I was just trying to answer your question. So that's nice that it was also a, a positive thing to say. But it's true. And, uh, and, you know, I'll always be appreciative. I'm sure the rest of the gang would say the same as well. And others like you met last night on our call, you know, they, these are other stragglers that are also the same, that have been learning law in France, in French, you know, from, oh. as an English person and thinking, why am I doing these weird things, you know? And there are other stragglers, and I know many of them, that uh, appreciate this sort of um, both and kind of space that allows them to... Uh, both, and, both and is big for me. In fact, a couple mm -hmm. of my current faculty are big into that too, and I love that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's funny, you know, because um, part of this is that just that I've, I've grown up very late and maybe I don't ever really want to quite grow up. I still quite like being in that stage of 70, not knowing quite what to put on the UCAS form. It's mm. something healthy about it. But I do say to Ollie, Virginia and Lena, and they don't know, they won't really understand this until they're my age now, mm. that I sort of, although I was really in my, my early 40s, and I was also just got married, so that was all mm. sort of happening at the same time, I sort of grew up then with all you guys. And I mm. think, yeah, people can grow up at different ages and mm. that's all fine. But, and, and it's also good not to entirely grow up, as I say, to keep that childlike mm. wonder, not childishness, but childlike wonder and openness mm. and innocence and energy to learn that, yeah, what, what, what's not to like about that? And when you, you exhibit that extremely well in a way I haven't seen, as I said at the beginning of this. But let's, so let's, let me ask, I don't want to go into the UCL stuff because we, you know, we could be here all day and that's well documented. So anybody can, we can put a link in to go see the arts and sciences course. But I mean, what is it? Five, six years in now? More than that. It's coming to the end of its eighth year now. So I, I've described how I found, yeah, I'm way out on my timings, aren't I? I, I <laughs> Getting I old, mate. It yeah, happens. I, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I've described how I found it in that very relational way. But, you know, you observed five full cycles then and a thousand students or something maybe? Uh, yeah, about a thousand in total observed. I think about five hundred we graduated. That was a big. I mean, first, milestone. firstly, massive congrats. But secondly, like, if you could try in broad terms to sort of extrapolate from that group, then something that had surprised you or that you found valuable. I mean, I'm sure there's thousands, but something that comes to mind. You know, did it work? Like, you know, you you created in one-on-one -on -one and with five others, a home for me that, you know, helped me flourish, I've described it. Does that scale? Did that scale? And did others report similar things or what else was surprising about it? Yeah, you've, we've laid a lot of very rich and, and deep points that sort of pertain to education there. So I'll, I'll try to do my best. Starting with the hard one actually is scaling. You know, when you were describing earlier that kind of personal respect and interest and, 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 and I was trying to say, I'm just interested in the life of the mind. Mm. I don't think that scales very well, honestly. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting in the whole kind of modern ed tech space, you know, I'm in this big new project now, and a lot of the interest is like, oh, is it gonna be online? Is it gonna scale? Mm. And that comes out of two interests, I guess. One is, is financial, honestly, you know, how can you make money out of this? Yeah. And another is, is impact, you know, can you reach a lot of people? And both of those are perfectly legitimate and interesting, mm. but they're not really the same question as what makes a transformational educational experience. Yeah is the education experience which deeply touches you and changes your life and mm. i think we still have to go to the human for that mm -hmm. and it's going to be small scale uh, mm -hmm. to, to some extent so mm -hmm. for me and my way of doing things we did push that as far as i could at ucl i had these kind of, i had genuine personal relationships i would say with 120 new mm. people every year and i mean you you came and saw it towards the end didn't you david uh, you, yeah. you used this phrase you said the volume of your work it's, <laughs> it was you said, jokes. you said it's mad it's mad yeah, yeah. and i had hit a point where you know i was by then 50 right? and i had yeah. this kind of personal relationship with very intense intelligent young people oh it was in in a good in a sense but good but then then too much it was doing my head in you know i just no. couldn't do it so I think the scaling is a real problem because we need more people like you and the people you mentioned to kind of go on and do this more in education and for them then they have to see the value in it both financially and in terms of impact otherwise you're never going to get that transformation experience with enough people and mm. you know mass education is often not deeply transformational it might help you get a great mm. job and that's never to be dismissed it might help you earn more money and that's all tremendously important mm -hmm. but if people like us who believe that there's more to education than that mm. i don't think you're going to scale it so um 
the big challenge that one in terms of the people that we attracted well you know you know better than anyone it yeah. was kind of a again a bit like a door to a, a land that a lot of these sorts of people have been looking for and never found and and that was just amazing and i had this luxury really to sort of create a course that i would have been happier with yeah because my people and there are a lot of them luckily it's not a narrow tribe you know yeah. it's uh, mm -hmm. amazing how i mean those graduates they're all much more clever and talented than me i know this sounds like false whatnot but they're seriously brilliant a lot of those uh, i can still call them kids i mean obviously i have a strong skill set now and i understand it and it's um happily right it's unique happily i seem to be very good at this weird thing which is managing very complex intellectual projects of an educational sort but you know that's not something a career advisor tells you about right <laughs> that does not really exist in most, most people's mindsets so in setting up this program um i was really concerned that i didn't have real skin in the game all the way along because mm -hmm. you're offering this very radical interdisciplinary program never really been tried in this country in a system and you're a systems thinking guy you'll know that mm -hmm. when you insert an alien thing into a system very often it will die mm -hmm. because it's not part of the ecology it doesn't connect with other systems for its life support. And it might be very valuable in itself, but like mm -hmm. most things in the world, if it doesn't have systemic support and integrate, it will die. That's basically, I think, what we're trying to do at UCL. So I was really anxious for a long time. And I, the only way I could put the skin, my skin, real skin in the game was think about whether I would genuinely do this course and be okay, or whether it was something I could say to my kids, even if they didn't want to do it. I could trust that mm -hmm. if my kids were made to do this course, it wouldn't kill them. They'd come out with something at the end that was valuable to them. But it wasn't until we had actual graduates and I started to see the amazing outcomes, the jobs they went on to, mm -hmm. and even the kind of PhDs they went on to, which everyone was really skeptical about. You know, unless you do three years genetics, you'll never be able to do a PhD in mm -hmm. anything. It just yeah. wasn't true. We had kids going straight on to the PhDs in things like computational cognitive neuroscience, energy systems, the internet of things and human behavior, mm -hmm. really interesting hybrid interdisciplinary PhDs. So once that started rolling, definitely after the second year, maybe even after the first year, I thought, yeah, this is a success. We've done it. And mm -hmm. you can start to reconceive what higher education can be for so many people. Mm -hmm. and that was an amazing feeling. And um, it reminds me of something I, I mentioned with the podcast with Ray Ice and a few podcasts ago about I guess the only shame or critique of the course, because I've loved it, is that it's so few people that are so excellent that get to do it. But I'm not convinced, as somebody waving the layman flag, that you have to be so excellent to touch into this stuff. Yeah, you know, or at least I want to believe, Carl, that you don't have to be the brightest of the bright to find a generalist home and a way to weave your different threads together. I know for some of the stuff you know, in knowledge power, for example, the super concept is deeply conceptual. Like it's the definition of as conceptual as you can get. And that stuff's hard, but I don't think in a, like a foundation course that's necess necessarily has to be approached in a direct way to get people on, you know, into the path. And hopefully we'll come on to this and it will, that this thought will weave together with hopefully what you're doing now and maybe what I'm discussing here about the verified learner's learner kind of uh, qualification. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I do have a hope that others like myself not going to qualify for UCL and maybe it would have been yourself as well would be able to, you know, find their way to make, to make a home if they're not so lucky to... I think I think this is a failing on the on the part of the institutions rather than on individuals like you. And there's a whole strand to interdisciplinarity to thinking about what this big, long, complicated word is, which mm -hmm. basically says it is kind of intellectual free play, just learning how you want to learn and mm -hmm. not thinking about subjects and oh, I've got to achieve in this subject. So in that model of intellectual free play and basically teach mm -hmm. treating the entire world as mm -hmm. your learning environment. Mm -hmm. which, which I think you do, that's great. That's almost like the ideal way to do interdisciplinary learning. Mm. The trouble is that that's almost by definition not institutionalizable. It's right. as individual as the people learning it. But that's a fault with institutions, not with learning or with knowledge. So mm. if we could have an institution which would take, if there are such things, and I'm amazed and delighted to hear you are there more Dave Erasmus is out there, but if we could take you know, 100, 200, maybe even 1,000 a year, mm -hmm. and give them that kind of uh, leg up, support, respect, opening mm -hmm. of horizons. Say, so basically, you learn however you want. All we're going to do is kind of be with you while you do that. That mm -hmm. would almost be the ideal higher education institution, I think, at the moment. 
The yeah. trouble is that it's just completely incompatible with educational bureaucracy. It, literally, I'm living this now with the kind of thinking about what a university has to do in order to be respectable. Yeah. You just cannot marry those two things. It's interesting in a sense because you're like poles apart. Now, how do we start to get these poles together? You know, your challenge really is like, there sh- well, it wasn't a challenge. You, you phrase it sort of humbly, but I see it as a challenge to us. Mm-hmm. You know, if, the, if, if universities can't take a Dave Erasmus mm-hmm. on a learning journey and get them to a significantly more interesting place on so many dimensions, then the institution has failed. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting because... Because in a way, right, take our relationship, I've delivered bits along the way i did a talk nothing went wrong i did a lecture got through it you know i've done some bits and i've i've ticked the boxes along the way as i've tried to up myself for the opportunities that have arisen professionally speaking you know take take the the piece of work i did that that i did the guest lectures on until that either becomes in a journal or written up or how whatever you call it when you write it up properly and then other peers go that's actually good work and it's part of the the library now or that work gets used in the real world in a way that people like it, it was of value to the real world, and we point back and say, well, that came out of this. I guess that's one of the main questions in the business of the academy is, if you take Dave Erasmus on, what is it that pays the bills? Can Dave Erasmus pay? And if not, what's the payoff? Because it does take effort and energy to bring people along, that coaching element. Let's just call it a coaching element. There's the knowledge and the access to knowledge, and then there's the coaching and the connections. When you say can Dave Rasmus pay, do you mean, do you mean what, what you're paying as you go along or do you mean what you're giving back as you go along? Well, it's just, I'm just thinking about the business of the academy. You know, these, the kids come to UCL. Firstly, they've proven something good because they got accepted. That's already a badge. Then hopefully they qualify and hopefully they get a job at, at a KPMG that would only accept certain badges. And... Then the question is, does the earning, increased earnings they get through their lifespan justify the 20 grand or whatever they paid to get into the course? And that's the business of it. The badges and hopefully the genuine learning equal more money, higher trajectory, which hopefully it pays for itself and the debt or whatever, or parents or whatever it is. You know, you have to ask, well, where's the business model for me? Because even now at 35, you know, I'm, I'm making a life for myself that I'm comfortable with and others around me seem to be happy with as well. There's no great payoff. <laughs> you haven't had a great payoff for investing in me other than anything that's incalculable. And but, but, Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, that's the point, right? I mean, you and I will pay money to have experiences. Yes, that's true. Don't look, don't look like payoffs to some people, yes. right? And it is uncomfortable, this. I mean, how, how do we square this kind of money? monetizing and mm. soulless metricization of things with the fact that education at the end of the day is about changing your life and people have come to think it's only about changing your life materially but mm. at the end of the day material wealth is also about changing your life spiritually you know it's a, you've got to have some basics to be able to function and mm-hmm. even think about spirituality that's clear mm-hmm. but the journey that education puts you on is definitely not just about earning more money and that's Mm. very hard to justify in the current system so now give us a bridge then between the ucl world and the world you're now in dealing with all this uh well back in back in my world now as as life's funny turns will have it yeah so so one of the many things you've taught me dave is you taught me i was an entrepreneur i think you were the first person to call me an educational entrepreneur so even if you don't get the post-academic accolade you almost certainly get the educational entrepreneur (laughs) academic uh, and, and one thing you, you taught me is that I'm good at risk of some mm-hmm. sorts. I always thought entrepreneurs are about taking financial risk. Mm-hmm. And actually, it was you and my dear colleague, Vin Walsh, who actually also taught me a lot about risk. There are many types of risk taking. There's emotional risk, physical risk, intellectual risk, and so on. And it wasn't a long conversation, really. You just said, you're really good at intellectual risk, Carl, mm-hmm. and certain types of social risk. You're not afraid to make a fool of yourself in Absolutely. some ways. And so that was really inspiring. And so, and so I sort of thought, wow, I'm an intellectual entrepreneur, an educational entrepreneur. Yes, I'm not good at financial risk, but that's okay, because in this sector, that's not such a big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't mean you're not an entrepreneur, just a certain type of risk you're, you're not so comfortable with. Then I started to think m- more about that and the, the part of the curve of the learning at UCL was flattening out. You know, I've been there eight plus years and learned so much and it made my career. I'd become a, a national figure to talk to about this strange new thing called interdisciplinary education. And I wrote some prestigious reports and all the yada yada that goes with that. UCL made me a professor, proper professor, which was incredible. And my family like, but you're not even an academic, Carl. How can you be a professor? So that <laughs> was kind of, yeah, it was kind of amazing. We were on the front page of the Times when 
in my new job, and it's a Professor Carl Gombrich. And I think my sister said, wow, you know, your grandparents would be so proud and pleased. And, and it is weird, because as I said right at the beginning, I'm not really a proper academic. So, but I'm very lucky, I'm very blessed that somehow the sector sees me as respectable enough to make me a professor, and that was mm. very big at UCL. But at the same time, I have this flexibility to be an entrepreneur and do creative things. So having reached that peak, you know, there are a few good things in the offering. UCL's always, always generated good ideas, but it got very big and a bit slow. A chap called Ed Fido, who started his own progressive school in East London called School 21, I knew was thinking of setting up a new university entirely on interdisciplinary lines mm -hmm. called the London Interdisciplinary School. It wasn't actually called that when I first chatted to Ed, but soon became that, that name. And I just thought, wow, I mean, this is the next step. This is really so ambitious to start a whole institution which has no departments, no set subjects, yeah, it has a coherence. I can tell you more about the coherence. So it doesn't just follow the individual. And I've got the experience now. I've got somewhat the track record and the, and the credibility. Let, let's do this. You know, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's try this. And so I'm a year into this project now. And mm. I like this London Interdisciplinary School to be around in 100 years. To look back at it and say, wow, that was a significant intervention in higher education. They, they changed our perception of what can be done and perhaps what should be done for some people. So that's the scale we're working at. But because it's such a huge scale, the challenge is utterly mm -hmm. immense and we're a bit like uh, i mentioned earlier we're a bit like this new organism in a system which is not trying to kill us but it just doesn't recognize us it doesn't have the support mm -hmm. systems for what we want to be as an organism so there's a mm -hmm. tremendous challenge in kind of getting enough tubes of nu nutrients between the bits of the system well, and what we are to survive you know that can take some doing to to bring in, as you say, an alien into an existing, on, and not just an existing system, but about as deeply entrenched and invested and structural as it gets, you know, and it's no small task. And is it fair to say that you're, I mean, it's basically, you're, you're the academic, aren't you? There's a bunch of commercial guys. And is it right to say that you're the lead academic on that in this I'm project? I'm the lead academic. I'm the founding academic. I think I was the fourth or fifth person to join the founding team. But now I've got a fantastic team of academics around me who, a bit like at UCL, are more brilliant than I am, more highly qualified than I am. And it's a, just a joy to talk to these people about why they're with us and what they want to do. And we had a very rigorous, very extended recruitment process, actually, much deeper than anything I've been part of previously. So we know how committed they are and how much they're, how attracted they are to this idea of interdisciplinary education. Mm. And actually it's funny you use the word collective intelligence, I think, I think just now because we're working on what the collective intelligence of our organization is. And that's mm. something you don't really get to do in a university. That's partly why they've become fractured because they're so big. Each department may have its identity, mm -hmm. but the university, it has other identities around the kind of its branding, its you mm -hmm. know, student society, but intellectually it often doesn't really, mm -hmm. have, can't really have an identity. What is it that you hope you may be able to do in this chapter with this organism that wasn't easy or couldn't be done when you were inside the establishment of the UCL? So I think the main thing that excites us on this program is this, the center of everything we do is real world problems. Mm -hmm. So it could be uh, climate change, it could be mental health of employees in a company, it could be obesity in society, it could be the pandemic indeed. It's got a name, this type of learning, problem-based learning, and it's very well established in certain pockets of the higher education system, in design thinking sometimes, in engineering schools, but it's never really been the center of a whole institution and, mm. and the thinking that you can bring to bear any subject pretty much on any problem these days. I like to challenge people on that and it sounds a little bit too liberal, but if you think about the pandemic, for example, um, it's not inconceivable that there'll be some kind of artist or graphic designer who gets the most impactful statement about this that the government's able to use. And certainly mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the graphics the government is putting out, there's a lot of criticism about that. Yeah. So you, taking something that are really random like art, something, how's that gonna help us with the pandemic? If that has such an impact that it led to a change in behavior that led to mm. reduction, of the, let alone, of course, all the things around the pandemic that we know about, you know, virology, epidemiology, modeling, human behavior, economics. So yeah. we are in this age where these complex real world problems, which are going to be the center of our curriculum, invite kind of creative and multidisciplinary mm. approaches to tackle them. And we're not mm. claiming we're going to solve these problems, mm. but we are claiming that to have a really comprehensive rich multi-dimensional view on these problems you can actually start from any discipline and ask the question what does law say about the pandemic what does mm. what do the arts say about the pandemic mm. what does economics say about the pandemic so the problems are going to be the center for us as an institution mm -hmm. we're going to teach a whole array of these of things called methods basically how how to do things 
Mm -hmm. And all our students will have to do this. So you won't come in and just do artistic methods like video making or installations or just statistical science. You've got to do a, a breadth of them. Mm -hmm. And then we'll allow students to specialize a bit as they progress through the program. But that breadth that we value is really important to us. Mm -hmm. And in a way, this is back to what I was saying about kind of the ideal institution for interdisciplinarity is a bit more totally student centered. It follows the student with mentoring and, and tasks and so on. It's a step towards that but it's a, a, a nice tidy step we can articulate in the mm -hmm. context of the current requirements for the UK university mm -hmm. system. Just a quick question on methods. Are, are methods things that have grown out of particular disciplines in the past and you're saying, well, that's come out of this science field, but, but it's actually a really helpful tool. Dave, um, you, you, always, you always read my mind and it's always just so bang on the money. So. Uh, this is a book by my maternal grandfather called Carl Friedrich. I'm named after him, but I'm not sure you can see that. Back yes, I can. Afraid. Yes. Carl Johan Friedrich. So he taught government at Harvard in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I think. And he taught JFK and Henry Kissinger, among other people. I was reading this r a random, probably a year and a half ago now. And he has this piece. He talks about the, and this is in a video I've just made for a course we're making for our new course about kind of interdisciplinarity. Oh, perfect. <laughs> a freebie. So he has this uh, passage. It's a little bit academic. So perhaps we can explicate it a bit afterwards. But it's making this connection between knowledge and methods. And you know, expli what, explicate isn't a very understandable word either. Do you know that? It's a posh word for explain. It just means yeah. explain in some detail. <laughs> But basically, he's saying what you were intimating in a sense that it's from methods that you grow bodies of knowledge because it's how you inquire about something mm. that determines the knowledge you get about the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'll just, I'll just read that. So he says, um, uh, it is in the nature of knowledge work, in contrast to the, opinion, to the opinions of laymen, to religious dogma, to poetry and the like, that such work is related to a body of learning, which steadily increasing deals with a particular body of experience mm -hmm. and which is thus enlarged by men, I'm sorry, but it's of its time, concerned with this particular body of learning. The scholars or scientists, so that's covering all the humanities and the science part of the whole knowledge spectrum, with the aid of methods regarding which there exists agreement mm among the workers in this field of learning. Mm. So, it's really well put. And I don't think, for me, the layman, you would need to read it three or four times, but there's nothing extra in there. That's very, very eloquently describing the nature of how we have to organize around tools that allow us to consistently inquire in a socially agreed format so that we might get that body of analysis of experience that allows us to develop pockets of knowledge that lead us forwards or, or help us understand the world more. But it's only with the method and the ability to agree to be together in it and consistent observation that we build up that something of use, if, if you will. That's what I take from it anyway. No, that's brilliantly put, Dave. Brilliantly put. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to use some of these quotes on my thing, so thank you. What I wouldn't have liked about that passage when I was younger is it has this element of what's now called social constructivism that Okay. All bodies of knowledge are socially constructed in some way by the type of social consensus that you're intimating. And certainly when I was younger, I, I wanted to believe there were you know, objective facts which would be there and discovered no matter what social consensus there was. As I've got older, I've become more of a social constructivist, but I still want to hold a bit of eternal truth stuff as a possibility that it's not going to just depend on some kind of agreement. There's stuff out there to be discovered, but it's certainly more complex for me now than it used to be as a sort of passionate young scientist who thought we were unearthing eternal truths about the universe. Mm. I'm much more now this methodological mindset that you just articulated that mm. it's the tools we use. It's the people that band together to use those tools to investigate aspects mm. of the world that give us these bodies of knowledge that he referred to. Well, tell me what you think about this. It seems to me that basically taking an observation of experience and attempting to reduce it to words or, or numbers, normally there's some kind of abstraction from the reality. And it's just about having an acceptable one that is recognizable and standardizable, that we are happy with this level of, yeah, we agree essentially that this is a 
maybe not perfect, but a, a reasonable enough representation of what the genuine experience was that we can build on that. And I may be doing certain disciplines or certain, well, let's get rid of the term discipline. I may be doing certain methods uh, a disservice by saying that, but ultimately I think that's the worldview I'm currently looking at how life and existence works is that there's far more than we're able to articulate or describe and far more nuanced, but it's helpful that we do bother and helpful that we do standardize and helpful that we do collect ourselves around certain methods because even if they're imperfect, they're still useful. <laughs> they help us get on. So I, I don't know if I'm being too, what do you call it? I don't know if you think I'm being too down on the, our ability to put reality into words and, and numbers. This is this is really deep, and I, my academic philosophy head is wary of saying something. It's a bit kitchen sink philosophy here. That's not what very, I mean. Just a bit crap, you know. Oh, I see what you mean. Just it, like throwing it away whilst you're doing some yeah, chores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, or, or pissed sixth former, you know, rather than just <laughs> deeply thought out. I mean, words like reality and so on are so so difficult to okay. to talk about, but. Um, not, not, I'm not saying you said that. I'm saying that I, I don't want to give an answer that is superficial in some way. What I, I guess is that, so it's kind of a necessary or sufficient condition sort of thing. So for, for sure, we're not going to make any progress in any area unless mm -hmm. there's agreement among a bunch of people about how to progress this area. Mm -hmm. But two things still are left after that. One is you can have lone geniuses who have insights and can't gather anyone around them. And the insights might be true, but they disappear from history mm -hmm. or, or they're not taken up because they could never build the consensus or the methodological tools to, to, to do that. Yeah. And the other thing is almost even worse in a way is that you still get groups of people gathering around certain tools and beliefs who produce a lot of crap. And we see this <laughs> yeah. with the internet. You know, we kind of, those, in, you know, those of us in university believe, and I think largely rightly, that groups of scholars and academics and, and scientists are deeply serious about truth and about... Mm intellectual honesty and reason and and that was always going to win right mm -hmm. because it's kind of self-evident if you present someone with these things with all the methods worked out and the, the reasons for them but what the internet is showing us is that a bunch of people can believe pretty much anything <laughs> and justifying it using pretty much any tools and they still go on to create their sort of knowledge or they call it knowledge and then what what do we do with that so actually mm -hmm. this has led us to what i thought we were going to talk about mm -hmm. today <laughs> which was new agreements because mm. my kind of challenge to you was mm. not kind of what we're going to agree on and what those new agreements look like but how we operate and this is another of my favorite books this is a it's nearly 10 years old now but it was so ahead of its time too big to know too big to know okay it's just full of insights but one thing he says that you know it's becoming clear that we're we're never going to agree on everything and in mm. fact they're going to be enormous pockets and centers of the world that can't agree about anything almost mm -hmm. <laughs> but but Weinberg says we have a shared world about which we will always disagree and I thought mm -hmm. you'd like that actually because it's about the sharing it's about the relationship mm -hmm. it's not a knowledge it's not sort of epistemological about what knowledge is that we can agree on but it's very hard to deny that we're in some kind of space which we're all inhabiting we have some relation to one another mm -hmm. so the question for me is how we navigate that space now yeah. given all the disagreement that there's always going to be so maybe you could say at some meta level, there has to be an agreement that we're not all going to kill each other, but it's mm -hmm. going to be very broad and abstract. Mm -hmm. And everything else is like how we set up systems and, and work things out, given these incredible mm -hmm. disagreements we all have between mm -hmm. each other. Well, I, there's something rings very true about that. And the reason is, is that, you know, one of the values in, in the community that we've been generating is around diversity. And that is about appreciating that people are different from different places, different doctrines, philosophies, narratives, and we have to embrace and tolerate and encourage and enjoy the spice of life as well that can come from that to an extent. There are some that, that prohibit others to, to ha have their expression as well. But so I, there's something I like about that. I guess I, guess my, I would say that, yes, on the basis that we have we apparently have this biological constraint that we need to breathe and drink water and stay at a temperature. And we have a biosphere that miraculously does that for us at the moment, or most of us at least. There's that. We agree on that. We have a plethora of disagreement about how we go about stuff. But somehow we've got to find some agreements that can handle those disagreements. And I know that just sounds like we're going round in an endless loop of agreement and disagreement. And maybe it is exactly that. 
to, to an extent. Like, just because we can't all agree doesn't mean that we can't seek agreement where we can. Something about that balance, and it goes back to the both and. There is, there is one thing I want to say before we plunge fully into this about your COVID-19 example of problem-solving thinking. Because I've been thinking about it a lot. Like, the world is being asked to try and understand, like, understanding how viral mathematics works from, like, never thinking about that to now being presented these graphs where they've got under, basically understand logarithmic graphs and try and have a model for what that means. And that's just like a really tall order over the BBC News. But I think you're making it sound like a harder sell than it actually is. I reckon in the world that we're in right now, it's the most normal thing in the world. It's what every single couch watching the telly is doing. We're all, all of us in the whole world are trying to solve how do we get out of coronavirus we're all doing it it's not an odd thing to say that we've got a problem and we need to figure out through multiple disciplines or multiple methods how we solve that i actually think that disciplinarian or i don't really know the words um breaking learning up into silos is a very odd thing to do that has yielded useful results but in itself is a very odd thing to do dave let me ask you there because this is really useful for me right because you're articulating it in another way and that enriches my understanding of my own work um i have an answer to this but i'm interested in yours how, how do you how do you meet the criticism of kind of superficiality that people would level at the armchair learner and say you're never going to get a breakthrough through that type of learning so uh, i go back to Givy, right when i started in Givy, which was thinking about why and how well, it wasn't even thinking about see this is the thing it wasn't even thinking about why and how we give the only thought i had at the beginning only problem i was trying to solve with Givy was how do we not lose a giving culture in the age of technology mobile phones and such as we move into that mobile social local paradigm i didn't have any insights i wasn't capable of having any insights but i had an architecture for learning that I could take five, six years to develop. And that ended up leading me through your doors. It ended up leading me to learn about micro behavioral economics, to learn about macroeconomics, to learn about neuroscience and into the realms of philosophy of whether like altruism is actually real state of the human condition to discuss. You don't have to know at the beginning how deep you're gonna go into your learning on that the critique that you're offering about how will that lead to an insight? Well, most of the time it probably won't, but it allows people to go as far as they can go or want to go. And especially in this lean learning environment that we have, where you can go, you know, make these learning cycles 24 hours, basically, between finding a new body of knowledge you want to interrogate, finding a coach in the moment to help you interrogate it, discover something and then create something with it and then go again the next day i mean it's almost Oops. a bit like the way ai works now with deep learning where it you know it you know alpha go alpha zero splits itself off into two different versions and plays itself a million times in 24 hours we're not as good as that but we're we're moving some one snail's pace at a time in that direction the critique is a false critique in my opinion because the answer is you don't you don't know at the beginning, how far someone's going to go and whether they're going to be insightful or not. And I don't know for me whether I will end up with any useful insights. I think I've had some insights already. There are maybe even unique insights, but I don't think any of them have proved to be useful to humanity. I think they've been useful on a one-to-one -one level and maybe at a 10, 20 person group level, I've seen some glimmers of signs of life of it. But I wouldn't say I've achieved anything with my learning journey that's led me to group level insight or useful insight. But I'm not I, sure, I'm I not wouldn't. Sure. But well, even but let's say I'm right. I, I wouldn't have thought if you had asked 24 year old me who had already missed university, already been successful in business. If you would ask me, do you do you think you would be spending most of your time? <laughs> reading papers talking to academics considering how to restart the governance system from like no it was never it was never on the cards none of that was on the cards but i have to say that you've highlighted you know the, the crux of the problem with education all education that it is absolutely mandatory that you declare in immense detail i mean hundreds of thousands of words and 
tens of tabs of spreadsheets exactly what will be achieved by the learning at the end of it. And that is the, the fundamental problem mm -hmm. in what I think we should be doing, which is pretty much, much what you articulated mm -hmm. and what I said earlier about ideal learning environment, which is inherently interdisciplinary in the modern world mm -hmm. and the system. And the system has its, its metrics of respectability, which is you say in immense detail what will be achieved at every single mm -hmm. step and by the end point of three, four years out, that is what you have to do. And mm -hmm. this, there is the paradox, really. The fundamental tension between learning as I see it should be practiced in the modern world, as mm -hmm. you've articulated, and where we are. Oh, you can see what a challenge it is to get those people to, the mm -hmm. people that get those ideas to talk to one mm -hmm. another. Okay, here's an idea. This is not what we're meant to talk about, but I'm just going to say it anyway, whatever. So in startup life, yeah, business yeah. tech startup, you have an idea most people think you're crazy. Someone gives you 10 grand. You have to go and prove, not that you can solve the problem, but that you can get to the next step, that you can operationalize that idea in a way that most people thought you couldn't. And if you do, the prize is, with some clever mouse, that you get the next pocket of money at a higher valuation. And basically, you self-prove six, seven, eight, ten 10 rungs in a row until you've got a billion dollar valuation and hopefully a billion dollar actual business. And I got chewed up and spat out at that organ I, at level three, let's say, or four, I got chewed up and spat out as an organism out of that system and, and have approached a different, a different way of thinking about myself now. But I'm just sort of thinking about what if like self-proclaimed lifelong learners, what if they were backable horses? You don't give them 10 million pounds now sort of thing, but maybe you give them like, two grand now you turn learners into like talent almost like you know how you might take on a, a potentially good singer and you you grow that talent or you you know you back a football player in an academy or whatever i'm just thinking that people are surprising <laughs> they prove you but, wrong a lot of the time and what do you say what do you say in terms of institution building the other day because that wouldn't be possible and be a university at the moment i'm just making this up so please forgive me and we can edit it all out but you could have gombrich's I mean, a, an old school academy. You could have Gombrich's school where you get your money guys to give you a million quid and you put that million quid into 20 learners or 50 learners or whatever it is. And you look after that talent. You do what you do with me. You listen to them. You're curious about their mind. You give them a home. You give them one book at a time to read, one other person to connect at a time with. And you take some equity, maybe after level two or level three, you know, once they're past, like the, they're into the master's territory, you then say, well, look, we can carry on, but, you know, we get a bit of, I get a bit of equity in you. You know, the Gombrich Talent Academy get 2% of your earnings from, from now on or something like that. And if you want to carry there, on, then we carry there on. Is a, there is a model like this for much more vocational targeted learning called um, Lambda in the States at the moment. They're doing extremely well. And they've sold it basically on that premise. It's mostly teaching coding. And they're actually very interestingly going into nursing now, which is completely mm -hmm. different. But it's basically that you, you pay nothing up front, actually. And you mm -hmm. pay a percentage of your earning as, as, uh, uh, when you do it. Mm -hmm. But they've marketed it entirely on the kind of instrumental value of education. You know, it's basically, mm -hmm. you're going to get this toolkit. We, we're so confident it's the toolkit you're going to need. We're not even going to charge you for it. And mm -hmm. at the end, we're going to get something back. And they're being very successful, I think. Mm -hmm. I love what you're saying, but I think mm. the issue for, for marketing in the current sphere mm. is, that, is that credibility for people that this paying for that kind of hybridness of personal and intellectual and career development, which you're talking about, mm. doesn't have a slot. You either kind of go to yoga retreats to do the, you know, I'm going to expand myself, or you get a degree, which is a financial investment, so you get a job in a bank and you mm. pay it all back. And that kind of hybrid, which I think both of us believe in fundamentally, mm. very, very hard to market. There just aren't kids out there. They always say, you know, what job will I get at the end of this? That, you know, mm. It depends who you want. And, I, and, I'm, and this will probably edit all this out, Carl, just so you know. But this is just me genuinely, because whilst we're on it, because we take, you know. We, oh, I think it's really important. That, I mean, that we've had the business model has to line up. When we've had these um, deep discussions about the, the pain of becoming uh, a university in the eyes of the current system, given what we want to do and given our values and given what we mm. believe where education should be, we've thought very deep and hard about mm. whether we need that badge of being a university or whether we start with something more like you're saying and seeing what happens. Well, it's two things, actually. It is, there is a hard, it is a hard business case as well. It's mm -hmm. much, much harder to get investment 
um, unless you're a proper university, it's much harder to attract students and kind of all the things that make an institution viable is much mm -hmm. harder. But there's also the kind of, you know, if we can get this right as a university and play really cleanly by the books, do everything correctly and just start to move the envelope mm -hmm. in conceptions, given that we're successful. So that's the part that kind of relates to what you're doing. Uh, maybe we'll have a really long-term lasting impact because the other route, I, I just don't see any way you're going to become a university. There's no way Dave Erasmus University just proposed there mm. is going to become a university in my lifetime. Probably never. It's got to survive long enough, right, mm. to become a university and that looks unlikely, but even mm. then will it ever look like what the system No, I agree. And I think that's where I'm sort of asking some fundamental questions about what the goal is, because if your goal is to have legacy and impact, and to create opportunities for people that may not know their own power. And also, as we've seen with some of the kids, get transformed through the process of it as well. Like, and to an extent that must have happened to me along the way as well. But learning institutions that require the end result to be known at the beginning and the financial structures that go with that, it's probably very biased naturally towards more typical candidates. I, I would imagine just as a very broad brushstroke thing, because there's not so much room for people to surprise you, really. I don't think so. Because I wouldn't have put more than a thousand pounds into my education at the beginning. You know, I wouldn't have thought it was worth it. I wouldn't have bothered because I would have thought, oh, I'm, this is what I'm good. I'm a practical guy. I'm lucky the web's come along. How would you turn your vision into a real university then? You know, does Carl care about a legacy of having a handful of people that went on to deliver useful insights and actually that's what makes you satisfied or do you care about transforming the landscape of university structure if i liken it to a religion for a second one might care about bringing the church of england out of the dark ages or they might care about seeing transformation in a couple of leaders hearts that um, goes on to continue to inspire and develop the world through think, the, the touch you know i think that's a very fair and relevant question for me and i think that i have a clear and honest answer is that in a sense i've seen the individual transformation at ucl and i was yeah. delighted to be there and it wasn't a few you know we're talking a few hundred which is already oh, yeah. honestly if, if you have the opportunity to positively impact a few hundred people's lives mm. and you and you die the next day that's all right it's not yeah it's bad. pretty good i really really believe in universities i think mm. they're amazing they're the, some of the perhaps the greatest institution mm. in the sense that we've Created. Maybe that's a bit hyperbole, but they've been around practically longer than any other institution mm. in the West. They survived out the, everything else almost. But I am concerned with where they are at the moment. I, I'm mm. both kind of morally concerned. I don't think they're doing the right thing in many ways. Mm. And perhaps I'm a bit, though, a bit, bit less financially concerned that because they're doing the wrong things, they're going to fall over pretty soon. Mm. So I do actually want to change the system. But the irony is because I think they're so wrong at the moment mm. and what I like to do is so different, there's a really, really big gap. Mm. So it makes it just a, like a mega challenge, but I think yeah. it's a, the right challenge. No, I hear you. So you're going after the system and trying to bring reform to the whole system. And so into that then, as we consider new agreements, and obviously we've talked a little bit about agreement and disagreement, but I would imagine there's obviously some agreements you're looking for in the institution landscape of learning what is that i mean aside from your project what is the fundamental agreement in society that you want the landscape to agree to you know to get that would allow i guess your thinking or any other thinking that you value that can't currently flourish to flourish yeah that's a, a, another great question so i'm aligned with you in liking diversity and ability to tolerate difference i've spoken about this before which i would call inclusivity really I think but there's a, a fundamental asymmetry between people who are inclusive and people who are exclusive because mm. the inclusive can't really, if they're maximally inclusive, ever exclude anyone. They're mm -hmm. always bound to include, but the exclusive is free to exclude everyone. Yeah. So it's much harder work cognitively and in fact to be an inclusive person because mm. you have to tolerate a lot of very difficult differences. And this actually puts me at odds with some people who call themselves inclusive, mm -hmm. uh, who tend to be more on the left wing, who say, oh, we can't tolerate certain right wing positions. I, I, mm -hmm. I disagree with that. I think if you're genuinely inclusive, you have to tolerate some very uncomfortable situations and people and beliefs from right and left. But, you know, we all have to have some values that we say, okay, these are my values. And one of them for me would be that type of inclusivity, kind of maximal ability to tolerate difference, discomfort, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think this type of course, with its sort of inherent value of different perspectives, uh, complexity and 
difficultness, honestly, of problems, mm. I hope will turn out a lot of people like that. Mm. Now, it's an ambition. Obviously, we won't be completely successful. The evidence seems to show from people like Jonathan Haidt and you know the radical mind of these sort of political psychologists, as they're called now, that there is there is possibly some innate in this so some people just cannot tolerate a lot of difference and a lot of uncertainty and so they've just got their mindset and I imagine if we have some of those they'll they'll leave the course and that's a shame but they won't be that sort of thinker but I hope we'd be able to take really the large majority on a journey with us to see that this is an incredibly rich way to be I mean, mm-hmm. to put it in kind of non-instrumental terms and also a really powerful way to act because mm-hmm. in most modern environments unless you're one of those people that's really kind of down the line, I oh, don't talk to those people, I exclude that. In most modern environments, when they're dem- democratic and they're complex and you're involving many different stakeholders and agents and environments and everything, mm-hmm. that sort of ability to operate is, mm-hmm. is a big advantage. Mm-hmm. Well, I talk a lot yeah. about trying to square circles, and I know it's impossible. But one of these circles we're trying to square with the kind of conception of education is that it's totally outcome-based. You have to know mm-hmm. in advance exactly where you're going is we've had to produce, and we have produced through some of our brilliant faculty, some kind of way of showing that people are evolving in those traits, if you like. Mm -hmm. They're evolving in the ability to meet a complex problem where it is and have some tools with which to address it. Mm -hmm. They're evolving in their personal development with handling ambiguity or uncertainty. So Mm -hmm. we need to, because it's required, but perhaps also it's a good thing to start to think, what do we mean to educate someone in this way mm-hmm. so it's not it, i'm still more sympathetic to your view that it's inherently open mm-hmm. it's inherently about that personal engagement with the problem and then the mentorship and you've got the internet mm-hmm. and, and to, i mean that is inherently what i sort of believe mm-hmm. but if we have to close it down at all let's just close it with this little cap which we're doing of like we want you to be able to show these qualities of being able to learn in mm-hmm. new mm-hmm. environments as i said comfortable with ambiguity with difference mm-hmm. and so on so that if you like is is an outcome for, for our program i i agree with that and i actually uh might be one of those people that you disagree with because when i hold spaces you know community events there is something we pro- we actively we don't say what will occur but we do say what we are protecting the space from there is essentially a sense a label on the door that says we don't tolerate people that don't tolerate <laughs> and that well, might be what you're critiquing well that's um, the Karl Pop- that's the Karl Popper paradox about democracy mm. I forget the exact quote but he says you know he's for maximal tolerance and so on and maximal diversity and mm. challenge but he says the one thing uh, a democracy can't tolerate is intolerance yeah and that, but that that's been held as a stick to beat him in some ways because mm. that fundamental paradox then everyone asks the question well, what's intolerance and you mm. get people who think you can't if you show you know criticism of religion is intolerance or and so it is very difficult because that yeah. basically you want to acknowledge that you've kind of blown your whole argument yeah. in some ways yeah well i acknowledge I, I i don't think i'm there with my thinking on that yet what i have is it's like i'm on the early part of that learning journey because what i do have is events that we've kind of used that where we've had 20 people in a room and the safety and the and the creativity and all the life that's grown from that safe place by people knowing what what they weren't going to be subjected to in that space has been phenomenal so there's something there that i know is valuable but i will probably continue to understand it more you raised something which i love to i love to say here and whether you use it or not in the end i don't know but i, I want to get this thinking out i'm very unacademically right i'm not like waiting to publish a paper on this and get the you know, mm-hmm. Gombrich said it first in 2020 yeah. in this journal. I, I just want us to all start talking about this because I yeah. think maybe that's the way we, we change. And it's this idea of non-linearity in education, basically. Mm-hmm. And you raised it then. But I think this is really deep and really important because we live in this world now where the dominant metaphor for so much of what we do is the network, whether it's mm-hmm. the network we talked about right at the beginning of this conversation that you leverage to learn things, whether it's the, obviously social networks we know about, ecological networks we know about uh, the internet is a network mm-hmm. this is not just a metaphor this is now a very rigorously studied mathematical object you can abstract mm-hmm. out from all these things and talk about these things in, in a really powerful mathematical way mm-hmm. and yet this idea of a network has not yet been applied in my view properly to learning and education so if you mm-hmm. think about all the things we've been talking about that that when we learn proper learning is some 
combination of ideas, tools, experiences, which basically is a, is a kind of interior network mm -hmm. of, of your view of the world. You've got nodes, which are th the little dots in the network, things you really know about, things you might spend quite a lot of time studying, and other nodes. Sometimes they don't relate at all. Then sometimes, and I think more than ever in the modern world, there's that, God, oh, that amazing coincidence. Yeah. Who have thought mm -hmm. it? You know, you've experienced this so many times. I know, you know, something you were learning connects with something else. So you're building up your own kind of, sometimes called a graph as well network of knowledge and that is valuable and it's not to be shied away from not to think oh, i'm not going to think about any of this i have to do more and more and more on this mm. node but what's happened is our conception of education our visualization has been like like a, a very narrow column that you start with some subject typically maybe three subjects at school and then just one and then you just learn in that very narrow column mm. all the way up and you learn more and more and more about that thing till you know masses about it that no one else in your universe understands or can talk about and surprise, surprise, you then go out usually into the real world and find that's completely useless. Mm -hmm. A fraction of that so-called deep expertise that you can use, which you thought was so valuable and spent so long doing, is minuscule. Mm -hmm. And what you've missed out is all these other nodes, which you now need to connect to do your career or whatever it might be, that you haven't had time or you haven't been valued in, in doing that. So I'm really concerned to build a whole vocabulary, whether it's a visual, artistic vocabulary, a, a verbal vocabulary, and perhaps most important because of the way these things are valued in our society, a metric. And it goes back to kind of what we do as a university then, mm -hmm. because then we could welcome people like you. We'd be like, listen, we're not going to make Dave write tons of essays. That's not his thing. Mm -hmm. He should be able to write well, and we have some evidence of that. But he's now getting into Bitcoin and understanding the fundamental nature of money and how that relates to trust in society. And now he's popping off and using that in a journalistic campaign. I mean, that network is so powerful. It's not hard to talk about. It's not hard for me to tell the story about and people get. And, and now, luckily, I work with an amazing artist at my university who's kind of visualizing this in really beautiful, mm, powerful mm, 3D mm. diagrams and everything. And yet, again, the, the way we assess, the way we bureaucratize this has absolutely no way to value this. If you're on, in a degree on one track, you can't hop out in the middle of year two and say, I need to spend six months learning this because that's what I'm passionate about. There's mm -hmm. no way to create a, a number around that which says you're doing that well. Mm -hmm. So I really want us at my new institution, London Interdisciplinary School, we're going to be working on this, but it'd be great to have everyone doing this. I'm not precious about who owns mm -hmm. this knowledge, but mm -hmm. we need to take the way we understand systems, ecologies, networks now, and, and think about how an education works in that way so we can mm -hmm. say oh that's a beautiful network or that's a powerful network or that's a certain type mm -hmm. of network so we have all sorts of quality descriptors which grow out of our understanding of this learning as a network yeah i mean i i totally get it carl um well even when you think about the human brain i know that the number of neurons doesn't increase after i believe 12 years old but the level of density of connections can increase up to whatever 40 or 50 depending on your fitness like a physical fitness thing and then after that you you know natural experience decline unless you're super fit and, and like yourself exercising and working out the brain all the time and really what you're measuring there is neural yeah it's neural density it's the number of connections the strength and the the pathways, the fluidity between the different neurons, that's the metric of quality, not just the number of neurons themselves. And, and it's like you could say that we're lacking that in our educational institutions at the moment. We know how to value the nodes, but not the, the, the connections between the nodes and the quality of connection between the nodes. And actually, when someone's doing something that appears random and a bit wasteful almost, they might be doing something very useful in increasing the quality of connection between the nodes 100 percent, 100 percent. you know this is great for me because i'm just exploring this now we've got mm. a colleague who's written a paper on the quantitative side of it here we are mm. some nice nose to look at <laughs> but yeah it, this comes down to a sort of assessment you see in the assessment culture because once you create an original network say around what you've done in your life the last 10 years who else is going to say whether that's good or bad, right? Mm, mm. Academia relies on the last generation. And sometimes the generations are very long, say in the hard sciences, and sometimes they're shorter in new mm. areas like media studies. But basically it relies on precedent, mothers, grandfathers and grandmothers saying, yep, this is good work, I give this an A or a B. Mm. But what we really want for this age in many ways is more originality, more mm. creativity, more original networks, hybrids which are individual. Mm. But who's going to assess that? And yeah. then how does the assessor's assessor basically regulations say yeah. this has been done well and yeah. people are terrified they can't take the brakes off to 
to mm. allow that. And so we get stuck in reproducing the same things when we need much more of the sort of mm. things you've been talking about. I think that's fascinating. I think that is completely fascinating. And um, I think we could do another one just on this. And I'm sorry it took us so long to get there, but I was having too much fun. Likewise. It sounds like this sort of focus on narrative representation of and metrification of neural density or the connections between pockets of knowledge is however you package it institutionally or otherwise it sounds like this is what might have got your attention for quite a while do you think or do you think it's a relatively short project no i mean i think like a lot of well, i think um steve and berlin johnson calls them slow hunches often mm. the slow hunches are the, are the best and they take us such a long time to articulate and then when they become apparent, it's like, everyone's like, yeah, it's obvious. Yeah, I knew that before, <laughs> but no one has actually articulated mm. it. And that can be a bit annoying talking about academic precedents and so on. It would be a bit mm. annoying if other people said, oh, I've been thinking about this for years or whatever, because I haven't come across it. And I know, I, and I stand to be corrected, right? I'm looking forward now to 20 mm. academic papers coming my way. I've been doing this for years, but I haven't come across it yet. So it's clearly not common knowledge. So I work in mm. these spheres and no one's talking in this way that I know about. From my perspective, I, clearly it's been growing, growing the whole, I have, I've written books, chapters, and parts of books chapters on, on structuring knowledge itself, mm. but the kind of flip to the learning thing and that it's the interior network of your knowledge and your methods and skills that has value for you. Mm. And therefore that the teacher should be assessing or the system should be assessing. That's just a little step, but it seems to me an important mm. step. It's been there a while, but I, I am excited by this. Like, like a lot of things in the first flush, mm. it seems really exciting. Then you try and nail down that metric. Mm. So we're working at the moment with Ibrahim Patel and my team on, you know, what does it mean for a discipline to be near to another discipline or far away? Mm. And we're looking at kind of journal cross citations. Mm. So for example, you know, if you've got the history of the First World War and the history of the Second World War journals, they probably mm. cite each other a fair bit. Mm -hmm. but if you've got the history of the First World War and you've got, you know, duck Bill Platypus's sex lives over here, they probably don't, they probably <laughs> cite each other very, very mm. little. If someone manages to make some connection between them, you might want to give them a big thumbs up. That's an amazing connection mm. you can make that's actually valuable. So got a very high score. We're trying to think, uh, is there a way you can start to measure disciplinary difference? Honestly, a bit like a kind of a, a diving competition. You get, a, a, as, as a learner, you get a mark for bravery, difficulty, attempt, and a mark for execution. So wow. if you've got the first part right, it'd be like Dave connecting tree planting with Bitcoin. That's pretty radical. And, you know, massive credit for trying that. But there's also an execution part and how well you've done it. And mm. that part as far as I can see, still remains problematic to assess because mm. there's your original. And so who's the person who's come along and say, wow, this guy has really changed our thinking on currency mm. and he's done it in a really interesting modern way when no one's done it before. But that's kind of exactly what you want yeah. to educate people to do. Right? But, there, but there could be fundamental human metrics that, that we kind of agree don't really change about the, the nature or contribution to flourishing that no matter how changing the methods are, the proof is in the pudding? Well, the trouble with the current education system is you have no real-world feedback. You only mm. have interior academic ah. self-referential feedback. Yes, yes. And of course, that's valuable if you want to produce more historians for the system or more biologists or more anything. Mm -hmm. But the great, you know, great value of being, say, an entrepreneur is that the real world will tell you whether your idea is any good. And mm. science, to some extent, is the same. Though science education, I think, is, is slightly different, but real cutting edge science has, has mm. that similar attribute. But you ideally want to take, you know, your project, you know, the blockchain and the tree and everything else and test it and see yeah. what, where it runs. And that is its value. If that's what you mean by human flourishing. But that, again, is deeply problematic to a sector which is trying to police its own quality. And you can understand why mm. it's policing its own quality, but that doesn't let it really test itself in the real world. Yes. And I'm a, definitely a fan of the of the real world part but I, I want to tell you one thing and then we should wrap up and we'll just have to do this again at some point and get deeper into this when maybe you're a bit further in and um and we yeah we'll just i mean this is by far the longest podcast recording I'm i've sorry, ever done mate, sorry no mate. no just as notes for our future it makes me think of larry sanger and the encyclosphere stuff thinking about creating a standard for encyclopedias basically which we don't have time to explore also makes me think of blockchain just over and over again because it is that networked technological infrastructure that might help deploy some of the thinking and maths once it's figured out about how to how to really think about and quantify these things but i just want to uh, admit something that i did a year or so ago and actually it was exactly a year ago i was on a train on the way back yes. from spain <laughs> on a cycle trip and I sat on, on this whole train journey on the way back. I was pondering the nature of networks. So I draw four 
nodes and I drew the lines between them and realized that there were six lines between four nodes, right? And I realized that five and then the number of connections multiplies at a different rate to the number of nodes. And so I tried to figure out for the first time in my life, like what the maths equation of that was. And I figured what it is and I can't remember what it is now. It's got something to do with a two, a pi, a divide, uh, a square root. It's got something to do with a square root, a two and a pi and, a, and an R but I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards. But I was incredibly awesome. proud of myself. And do you know what was fun about it is I had no idea then, and I still have no idea now, whether that was primary school maths I figured out or whether that was completely original thought that's never been thought of. I've still got no ideas at this point. And actually in that kind of abyss of, of reference or context, I just had a bloody great time. And then actually at Nico's birthday party in your very common room to bring this all to land that I didn't realize we were coming right here. A French girl, a friend of Ollie's helped me tidy up the equation and just rearrange it in a way that was more elegant, shall we say. That was a beautiful moment for me. And one day I'll show you it because it, it may be primary school or it may be something that, um, well, at least could be a gateway for others like me who want to care about your interest and the focus on neural density and, and kind of thinking about how do you describe it? That whole thing we've just talked about. I just call it a kind of network conception of, um, of education. Network uh, conception. The values in the network, not, not mm. in that linear, the, the linear silo. And we need to find a way to, to, to measure that value. That's a great story, Dave. L listen, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you, become a mathematician later on because someone like Nassim Taleb you know he, he describes how he struggled with stuff that he wasn't very interested in and once he was just passionate to understand things he just he just he describes how he just ate it he ate it for mm -hmm. breakfast advanced mathematics but books and he's mm -hmm. become you know a brilliant uh, re researcher in mathematics so uh, it's fascinating how that the mind when it switches on when it really wants to do something yeah wow the limits are pretty far out there are very few limits I agree in principle. I think uh, I do some things. I do make connections that others don't make. Uh, I don't think I can get to the place of excellence that many of our friends can get to, but I'm lucky to be around them so that I get to breathe it in. But Carl, this is, as anybody who's listening to this will be able to see from the nature of the conversation, it's a treat. And I, I will always enjoy our conversations immensely. Uh, I may not enjoy the edit though, I must say that. It's gonna take me about two days straight, but um, but that's uh, an issue for another day. Do, do a Joe Rogan one, mate. Do a one hour 30 something and say, just, it's, you know. Just press go on it as it is. It will have to be, it will be a bumper edition and I don't doubt that we'll come back and do your final idea there about uh, the network conception of education in, in, in great length and detail. And that will be great fun as well. But for now, thank you so much for taking us into your past, into the journey that led you into finding your own place in the world, finding a home, creating a home for others, and now trying to think about how to take that to a new level in your own organism that is developing and finding its way to connect itself to the established educational landscape as we speak and i i'm cheering you on from the sidelines and excited to see what the next steps are anything thanks, Dave. anything thanks. you want to close with no i just want to say thank you for your inspiration you know you're very important to me and uh I look forward to many more conversations like this informal formal, whatever brilliant uh all right mate thanks so much see you again soon take care